Hi, and welcome to the Founders Journey Podcast. I'm Greg Moran with my uh, co-host, Peter Dean. Welcome back, Peter. Thank you. Hey, for thanks for having me back. I'm, le- yeah. I'm let back in. I, I I didn't know I had a choice in that, but since <laughs> I, now I, I know I have oh, a choice. Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, Founders Journey Podcast is uh, about coaching and actionable tips for founders by founders. And uh, we've got a great one on here today as our uh, as our guest, Baird O'Neill. Um, is a uh, prolific writer on uh, on Twitter at uh, Barrett J O'Neill. Uh, on o- is the uh, founder and owner of On Demand Storage up in the Boston area, I think, right? Uh, yep. Fair. Yeah. And yep. Uh, and Brightline um, Brightline Media, which um, is actually one of the better company names I've heard in a long time. So you're gonna have to tell us how you come up with that because it's, it's pure <laughs> genius, Barrett. So Barrett, welcome uh, welcome to the uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here. It's been fun getting to know you guys on on Twitter and um, through the Zooms we've had leading up to this. Absolutely. Oh, very much likewise. So Barrett, um, funny story. When I started uh, when I started the Twitter kind of journey here, I think I had seven followers and uh, and somebody told me that the way to um, that the way to start to engage on Twitter was to find people you found interesting and start to communicate with them. So I think I like lurked on on Barrett's uh, feed for a while and commented and stuff. And then finally he became nice to me and we, uh, and, and we've become friends since. So, uh, so he's really been instrumental in that, uh, instrumental in that journey for me and has certainly been a mentor in, in my own, uh, my own growth on Twitter. So always will appreciate that. Yeah. I have a hard exterior, but one, once you crack through, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's my, it's my charm that does it all the time. You're right. It, really, it just, it just chips, it chips away at the hardest, uh, at the hardest shell. Um, so, you know, love to start with you telling us the story. How did you, where did your own founder's journey begin? How did you get going? What was it that kind of started you down this path? Yeah, I have a pretty cool story of, of how we got started with on-demand storage. So when we were, when I was at college, I, I finished up at Babson College, which is in the Boston area school, kind of dedicated to entrepreneurship, um, which kind of helped foster the feelings that I was having towards doing my own thing and, and trying to make my own way in the world. Um, and so the Red Sox were in the, in the World Series, game six. And we're taking the train in to go to the now deceased tequila rain bar, which anybody from Boston is, <laughs> is going, Oh man, come on right now. But so we're, we're on, we're on the way in and a guy comes behind us and says, Hey, I saw you guys came from Babson. Um, you, you know, what's going on. And he was going to the game. And so we get to talking and we asked him, Hey, what do you do for work? He said, I'm retired. He was about 40. So that's interesting. He turns out he sold his company for $400 million a couple of years prior. And now he's a pretty well-known VC. So I'll keep his anonymity for, you know, a, 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 I'm not sure how public he wants to be, but he, on that train ride, Obama's barricade was in town, blocked the track. So like a 15 minute trade ride turned into literally like this two hour conversation. And it was unbelievable. We just, he was so open. He gave us all this information. He told us about entrepreneurship, told us about why he started his business. And so that kind of just created this itch. And then at Babson, there's a ton of international students. I realized, hey, they got to put their stuff somewhere. I created a little website. My partner at the time was putting flyers under doors. And we get like, I think we got 67 students signed up and we stored them all in my parents' basement. And we made, (laughs) it was awesome. awesome. I think we, we each made like roughly $11,000, um, which was twice as much as I was going to make the whole summer working at UBS. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> okay, that's all, that was all I needed right there. Um, this and entrepreneurship kind of, thing is what, easy. What right? was your, <laughs> what was your overhead? Your, what did your parents, uh, rent the, the basement for? Did oh, they rent um, it to you? Well, I always say that was the best business ever. I think it was like 94% profit. Um, <laughs> made, like, we paid for a U-Haul, I think, and then like a little bit of a little bit of uh, maybe had a couple friends who who helped us helped yeah. us move the stuff. But they, what we noticed about our friends is they would help us for like two hours, and then it would be like They're three done. p.m. So it was like acceptable yeah. to start having a couple of beers, and they were they were just MIA all of a sudden. So, <laughs> yeah, but that, awesome. that was pretty much how how we started. And then with on demand, what happened is I went and worked for a year. So I worked in an investment company in Boston. Um, my other partner worked at uh, uh, Dell for a year and we both were like, this sucks. And so we, companies in, in 
the West Coast were raising money on this idea of on-demand storage. That's what TechCrunch and yeah. those companies were referring to right. it as. So I was like, I'm just going to Google this. So I Googled the domain. GoDaddy comes up. It's available. It was like $3,200, which to me at the time, like it, it might as well have been 200000 And yeah. I, But I said, you know what? I'm going to buy this. I bought it on my credit card right there. And then we kind of just knew it was a good idea. And we just kind of built the company around that. Um, and that was like almost six years ago. And then so you built the company around the name. Yeah. Well, I felt in, and it's, yeah, it's, I think it's a unique opportunity. I'm not even sure how you'd replicate it because I think it was just right. so unique because like TechCrunch, Forbes, and like, if you Google on-demand storage and scroll to like page two or three, you'll see it's like clutter raises $8 million series A or like make space raises right. $10 million yeah. series A. And so I was just like, at a minimum, I bought it. And I was like, I could probably just sell this domain. Like, this is just an oversight right. by someone like, you know, it's like, Hey, like once you start seeing terms like that, it's like, you know, you might want to buy that domain. I mean, it seems good. I think on-demand economy, like Uber obviously was leading that charge. And then you had a lot of other companies kind of pop up around that. So the whole idea of just like things coming to you was big. And then I think the cable companies in particular, Comcast and Verizon, they really took a liking to the phrase on demand. And I think that kind of made it ubiquitous across the nation. Yeah. So that was really like the driving force. We're like, hey, there might be something here because this is great. So like we bought on-demand junk doc. Like I own a million like on-demand yeah. domains because yeah. I just feel that like that resonates with people. So yeah, I, yeah it's like, it was kind of a luck thing, I think. And you know being what, a little bit opportunistic. You know what the the, the genius about that, that I, that I just, I love with that is, and this is something I talk to founders about all the time. It's going where the macroeconomic wins right yeah. back right yeah. go and you just you see so many startups that go out and they just do it the hardest possible way right they're using terms that are older they're using like and 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 it makes the entire business sort of sound old right and so much of that is just positioning into where the macro sort of forces are moving right there was this big tailwind behind on demand and you guys just kind of put yourself you know it's like the jet stream right it's you know, a plane flies at 300 miles an hour and it gets up to the jet stream, it flies at 600 miles an hour. So go at 600, don't go at 300, right? And, but it takes that kind of, that wind at your back in order to do that. And that, that's what those kind of macroeconomic forces do for you. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think, like I said, we were, we were opportunistic with it, but I think the way that I've come to view entrepreneurship in general is like, whoever has the lowest slash most sustainable acquisition costs of new customers will win. Um, yep. in the long run. And that assumes like a baseline level of competence. Like your product is like bad products who yep. give away the product for right. free. Like is, you might, it's not going to win in the long run. So I'm right. looking at saying like the, in the long run, you win by acquiring profitable customers at the lowest possible price. And it's like, yep. so yep. how do you do that? And I think that's where something like the name for on-demand storage has probably say, it's hard to quantify, but we don't spend any money on paid ads. Our warehouses are stuffed to the brim and we could expand, but it's like, do we want to, the real estate market is kind of making that a little yeah. tough. So there's other pressures pushing against us, but we've probably saved, I don't know, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars over the last five years, maybe more of just not having to spend money on advertisements to educate. And then the yeah. best part about the whole thing is companies like Clutter and MakeSpace are out there spending millions and millions and millions talking about storage with pickup on demand. And it's like, great. And people are, like, are you concerned about the competition. I'm like, no, I hope they come here. Cause there is going to be a subset of people who right. Google on demand storage and we're going to be there every single time. Yep. And like the, no one has loyalty in these types of industries to like, Oh, this is the ad I saw. So that's a company. And it's like, yeah. no, does it look legit? Do I trust them? Can they do what they say they're going to do? And are yep. they available? You know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's awesome. So, so then you, you, so you built these companies, first of all, just a quick aside, Babson, by the way, I applied and didn't get into Babson three different times. So oh, I could have been man. a fellow nice. alumnus, but I was not good enough to get into Babson. So three, I didn't three even take it in that bad. That's so. it. I'll, I'll never donate another dollar until I get <laughs> his degree. <laughs> That's right. I at least want an honorary degree or something right. out of there. It's just, to make, just to make my life, just to make my life worth it. Um, oh, so, so you moved, so you moved from, you know, starting these businesses and then eventually you kind of found your way onto, onto Twitter and really focusing on audience building, but as a kind of a business in and of itself. I mean, talk, mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit. 
Yeah, so uh, Twitter has has been life changing for me, and it's happened pretty quickly. And I'm still kind of my head is spinning sometimes when I open my app and see that I have like almost fifty thousand people following me. Um, but I, what it ties back to is two main concepts that I just fundamentally believe in. However, they manifest themselves. One is what we just talked about, which is lower lower customer acquisition cost of products and services. You will win. And so I think an audience gets over the hurdle of a lot of the the difficulties of acquiring um, customers. And then to that end, I think paid media is only going to become less effective in the future. I think you've already seen that with like iOS 14 and stuff, but Mm -hmm. there's something about, there's so much noise out there and there's so many advertisements and on your apps and on everywhere, you're constantly getting hit that it all seems the same. So if you can break through that into the earned media, which for me, earned media falls into like organic social following. And I guess if you're talking about search engine traffic would be organic traffic from Google through SEO. And so like the earned media just feels like that's where the, the, the future is. And so that was one reason for building the audience. And the second reason is when very intelligent people are all doing something, I think it makes a lot of sense to pay attention. And I've started recently resharing my content onto LinkedIn because I've noticed the same thing. Like a lot of these intelligent people who are early on Twitter are now sharing on LinkedIn. So for me, it's, that's just a good rule to live by. Like if, if you know, 20 smart people and 17 of them are doing something like probably should get in line. (laughs) So, right. And so it's, that's that, those two drivers are really what, when I don't feel like writing something, that's what kind of pushes me to 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 do it is like I know the asset value is there. And then there's also other benefits like it makes you a really clear thinker. It helps me become a better better problem solver and stuff like that. So those have been like the ancillary benefits that I I had no intention of like acquiring those benefits, but I yep. I have through it as well. Yeah. Well, it's I mean, I know just in the just in the time that you know I've been doing it since really, you know. I've probably been on Twitter for 10 years. Um, it never did anything. I mean, you know, just kind of read the news periodically or something, but, you know, just in that amount of time, I mean, just the, the, that act of writing every single day and what it does just to catalyze your thinking, right. Is, is just such a powerful thing. I mean, yes, there's all this audience building. Yes. There's all this, there's all this sort of asset, tangible asset value that comes out of it. But to me, that that intangible of just being able to almost catalog your thinking or catalyze your thinking, right? Um, in a way th- that you just would never do this, right? You would never write down everything you've ever known about, you know, starting a company or things like that. But, but you know, you write every day, you end up, I don't know, you write everything you've ever known, but you certainly write a lot of it, you know, and yeah. you would never, you would never do that, right? It's almost like writing your autobiography a little bit at a time, you know, 200 char- 280 characters at a time. It's interesting to think about what this will look like, you know, like imagine if Benjamin Franklin had had a Twitter or something like that. And we get to like, scroll <laughs> through his actual, you know, it's like you get an autobiography, which is great. Yeah. It's like, imagine if you get to scroll through like <clears> his, just his daily thoughts and stuff it would have been awesome. But um I think you you raise a point that I think is worth touching on, which is exploring your own mind and thoughts allows you to create the connection between like generally accepted principles and then like your own unique experience and connecting those dots. And that's how the world never runs out of new ideas and concepts. It's like right. there's these universal truths, like people want things faster, like we want better service, we want it to be safer, we want it to be more exciting. It's like those are all, we all know that. But then it's like, how does that manifest itself? It's like, well, you have different experiences than me. So us looking at the same problem, we're going to come up with two different solutions. And then maybe us connecting a unique dot between how we're looking at it. That, that's how it just continues to, uh, ideas just continue to, to come up. And I think that's a really exciting part about exploring your own mind, but then also exploring other people's thoughts, because then you right. can see something and then reach out to them and say, hey, I thought of this. And it's kind of weird because it's almost like, you talk about reading people's minds and like, that's always been something people have joked about. Like, would you, you know, if you had a superpower or something, but to a certain extent, and maybe the realms you want to read someone's mind, like that's what Twitter kind of is. You're like reading their beliefs and thoughts and views. Totally. on different problems. <clears throat> I think, yeah, I think one of the things that you guys have kind of pulled out, but didn't really state is that it enables an acceleration of innovation because like the sharing mm-hmm. and the availability of information from like, 
you know, if Ben Franklin could share that, how, fa how much faster would have we evolved in, you know, what he was doing and, and the innovations that he had, instead of having to have this like big gap of time where you could learn that, that acceleration of just sharing, you know, obviously right. has helped me. That's too, super but. interesting. Like the real time nature of it. Yeah. It's like yeah. what I, what dot would have been connected had someone seen Ben Franklin's tweet or something, yeah. you know, that like might right. have changed how things played out. Yeah. Some it, other it, engineer has come in and say, Hey, I've been thinking about this. And then, yeah. you know, it helps. That's, an, that's really, in, that's really interesting concept to think about. Um, well, that's what you guys are doing. That's it. It's the pace today. of iteration, right? I mean, it yeah. happens all the time. Like this, this happens to me every single day. It happened to me, I think twice this morning, right? Where I read something that, you know, somebody puts out, Barrett puts out, or one, you know, somebody else that I, that I follow puts out. And it just, it sparks a thought in me and Barrett and it, you actually, Barrett, you and I had this happen this weekend. You wrote you wrote a, a thread, you didn't know this happened, but it happened. Um, you wrote a thread on decisions, right? And I was thinking, geez, I mean, these are like, you know, the decision, like the critical decisions you make in life, right? And it was a brilliant thread about mm -hmm. like, you know, how, how there are, there are a few decisions in your life that really matter. And I started thinking about this, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, it's the same thing in a startup, right? There are a few things in a startup that really, really matter, and the rest don't. And then, yeah. so I kind of took, your, you know, your, your sort of base on that. And then kind of went off on a riff on my own about how this really affects startups. Right. So it's, you know, I think it's, it's that iteration of thinking. I think that's the real, that's the real power in it, you know, and it really, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about engaging, do it right. Because that happens to everybody. It just doesn't happen to us who are writing every day. It, it happens to everybody. People are reading, our stuff every day and having these thoughts, then jump in, right? And jump in that conversation and start contributing to it. Yeah. And, and uh, Dave Klein tweeted something this morning. He's a great follow too, is he, um, he tweeted something he tweeted something, I responded to it. And then he, in response to that, tweeted something along the lines of like, with the, the scale of digital, <clears throat> you're, you never know who's like passing by, which is right. an interesting way <clears throat> to think about it. Like all you have to do is catch, some, the right person's eye and it's like your entire world can be flipped upside down and there's countless stories about how it how it's happened like you know there might be some incredibly successful entrepreneur who just likes the way you think for whatever right. reason like the way you write gives them yep. insight into the way you think and they say like i want this person around because i like their critical thinking skills and if you're not putting yourself like that may not, like it probably won't happen. Like I'm not expecting my phone to ring from Elon or somebody like that, but you just never know. Yeah. And if you're not in the game, there's no way to, to make that happen. And the scale of this, I think is hard for the human mind to wrap around. Like I was yeah. looking at, like I had 21.4 million impressions in the last 20 days, 28 days. That's yeah. like 800,000 impressions a day for yeah. a month. And think about that. And it's like, who saw that? Maybe this time they didn't reach out or they didn't retweet me or they didn't because it, it, but the sixth, seventh, eighth time they see you, who knows, right? It's, how, you know, I like that. How many people, oh my God, how many, how many people, Dave calls it, by the way, serendipity acceleration, which I think is like the greatest yeah, term ever. It, um, yeah, how, is. how, how many people, you know, does CNN hit on a daily basis? Right. I mean, it's less than that. Number. that I don't right. Think. It's just, you know, it's mind boggling. You're right. You're right. That that sort of because we, you know, we think in terms we think linear. Right. We think sort of incrementally, you know, if I can get 20, you know, 20 more people or 30 more people. But you don't even think in those terms of of, you know, 100,000 or 200,000, a half a million, a million, millions. Right. I mean, um, you know, it's 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 crazy when you start to think of the distribution power that's out there. Right. And, and you start to bring that back to to a business and what that can really mean. It's just, there's, there's nothing you, you know, email marketing and paper, you know, PPC or like th these things can't even, they're not a, a they're not a hundredth of a percentage of what no. you can do when you start to, when you start to really extrapolate this out. So just moving, uh, moving on here. So you, you wrote recently about being a millennial and, um, and just yep. in case you're wondering, Peter and I are not millennials. So I, <laughs> I know you were probably thinking that yeah, these guys are all millennials. You guys look great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank wow. you. Thanks. Yeah. We're, you know, we're, we're both about 94 in, in, uh, <laughs> in, in some form of math here, but, um, but the, um, 
you talked about the uh, the trade off between time and money, which I thought was a really interesting thing. If you yeah. look at your generation, say versus your parents' generation, or certainly our, our you know all of our grandparents' generation, how how does this how has this really affected your thinking as you've gone out and you've built businesses and it, it yeah, can, and, and really create like, that leverage? When we talked about like why you would start, you know, when you talked about kind of that trade off. Yeah, I mean, I so I think the evolution of a business career or an entrepreneurial career should change. And ideally the more assets you have personally and the more knowledge you have, the more leverage you should have. And like, so this should be something where your time and money are going in opposite directions throughout your life. And I think, I think there's a distinction that is important to make is when you're first starting out, your, your, your time is actually going to be below like your, or your money is going to be below your time right. in terms of value. So like I right. went for probably, so I went from like out of school at my investment company, making like a pretty good salary out of college to like, literally, I, I think in year one of my business, I made $10,000 in year right. two, I made $23,000. So for two, in two years, I made $33,000, but it's like, it it's exponential on how you grow once you figure this out. But I think you have to figure it out for yourself a little bit. I always knew that these concepts existed, but I don't with, without, unless you're a very good with technology is probably the one way I think you could potentially break through this a little bit. Yeah. Outrun it. Yeah. Like if you're, if you're mm -hmm. like an extremely talented coder and you have some level of distribution, you could probably break through this in a short period of time, but I'm not that. So it's like, I'm more of like a thinker and ideas, man, and I can make things happen. So with, I had to do and learn a lot. And it's like the, the, the lessons you learn by doing is what allows you to then break the time and money relationship yeah. later on, because you can direct other people to do what you know will work. And I always yep. used to think starting on entrepreneurship, like, Oh, why are second and third time entrepreneurs? So, so it's so obvious now having gone mm -hmm. through, like yeah. I've probably made 10 mistakes that I cannot believe that my storage company is in business. Like I've probably done right. 10 <laughs> things where it's like, if somebody else did that, I would be like, they're done out of business. Right. We, and, like, we, we never made those through, mistakes. Through, but, yeah, it's like not we never did any of that way to do it. And so it, now how does that affect me now moving forward? It's like the things I'm focusing on now, uh, my audience, which is like probably the ultimate time and money break, right? Like people who have really big audiences yeah. can send a tweet and maybe make 10, 15, 20, $30,000 if they right. have the right audience. So it's like, yeah. that's pretty good for a tweet. Um, yeah. Tough yeah, to break exactly. the time, Like you got to be pretty, pretty uh, rich to break the time money relationship more than that. Yeah. Um, but I think that, um, it, the other one is like, is software stuff that, that I'm going to work on, which I know we're going to get to in a little bit. But mm -hmm. so I think the evolution, like my first, the start of my first business was super manual labor and like figuring it yep. out and like going on jobs myself and learning this. And now I'm evolving into like building audience. And so like, I'm kind of moving down the stack of leverage, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's what I, I, but I don't know that, I think the average entrepreneur can't break that cycle. And I think a lot of people want to start at like the audience, but it's like, how am I able to build an audience? Well, I'm able to draw on what the hell I did for the last six years yeah. by learning and making mistakes. Yeah. So it's like, you know, this process is really hard to skip out or else it's hard to build those assets later on. Cause like without to build an audience without interesting experience is kind of difficult. I think this um, is, uh, this is the theme one. we've heard yeah, this before uh, where yeah. you have to go through that process. And if you think about it, this is the process that a venture fund wants the business to go through, get, you go in the dip and then come out with trajectory right. because all the learnings and everything you did from losing money brings you out of profitability and on a, like a big North trend. Right. That's and that, right, yeah. that's why they invest. That's kind of, and, and you're oh, talking totally. about it as a person, you, you have to kind of go through that where yeah. you've given up. And I, I don't know of an entrepreneur that didn't do that. You have to give up a lot of potential, like stable cash, to kind of break through and go, Oh, wait a minute. Now I'm North way North of that. Like, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. the, I think it's the conundrum of just, it's kind of the conundrum of decision-making in general. It's like, it's yeah. John C. Maxwell, who's, who's a very interesting author. He mm -hmm. writes about this in a book that he has on growth, which I'm actually going to do a thread on this. I've been wanting to do it for a while, but I couldn't yep. find the words, but on the law of trade-offs, right? And it's yeah, just, right. it's this really interesting concept that is just integral to everything you do in your life. And 
you'll never get out of trade-offs, but for me, and like drawing on the thread I wrote last week, it's like, what am I not willing yeah. to trade? It's like, I'm not willing to trade time with my wife and son, but it's like, yeah. I'm also like, I also, I do. And I think it's okay to say like, I want to be a successful entrepreneur and I want to have a lot of assets and resources yeah. so I can do the things they want, but not at the expense of these other things. So right, what's right. your option? And it's like, well, there's only one. It's like, you've got to make a lot of money per hour, or you've got to find a way to separate those two concepts. And so- yeah. Like, I think if, if you look at it through the lens of trade-offs, then you realize like you have no choice but to use leverage. And right. that's just kind of, if you want it all as much as you can have it all, which I don't necessarily think anybody can have everything, but if you yeah. want as much as you can possibly get in all the different areas of your life, leverage is the only way. Um, yeah. You know, and I think code and audience happen to be like probably the best forms of leverage moving forward. Yeah. Um, you know, which is why it's the best time ever to be alive, I think. Yeah. yeah you, why don't you, you know, talk a little bit more about that start? Because you didn't really hit on it. Starting a company now, the barrier and the entrance is way different than it used to be. Right. Even for technology, which is yeah. super, like, unless you're doing like really, really cutting edge tech, like, which let's be honest, most companies that claim they are, are not. <laughs> right, right. Which is fine. Like it's yeah, fine, but totally. there's very this, few. They're selling a variation of a little thing they did. Right. Yeah. It's like, is there is there true like autonomous like you know something maybe that um, like Elon's doing with Neuralink? It's like okay, that's pretty cutting right. edge stuff. Like we're not yeah. going to outsource that, you know. But it's like exactly. if you're creating some sort of app that like some sort of productivity app or some sort of crm based app it's like look you don't need the nine hundred thousand dollar per year senior engineer to do that you just don't right. you need a product roadmap and you need people who can code and and make things work to get that yep. done so you yep. know that th that's a good thing though um yeah because it democratizes some of this stuff for people that entrepreneurship was reserved for people who had like incredible risk tolerance and or resources with from their family in previous right. generations that gives that's them still that true risk. to a certain extent, but not yeah. even nearly as much as it was in the past. Yeah. Well, if you, you know, if you looked at, you know, one of the things that fed that too, I think was the, you know, the way that the venture capital industry worked in a lot of ways, right. was so insular. And so, you know, if you didn't graduate Stanford, you didn't graduate Harvard or another right. Ivy league school, or you didn't have the contacts, right. You didn't have the money to go hire a developer and you did like, you know, this just sort of cycle was so perpetuating, right. That I think, you know, now, you know, I mean, you, you don't, there are, there are things you can go do today. There are, there are technology products you can go build because of no code development that, you know, you yeah. can just go do this yeah. on your own, right? And teach yourself to use one of the no code tools or, you know, or things like that. So I think, you know, that's those barriers. I just think about when I first started my, my first company, right? And this was back in the, back in the uh, late nineties. And, you know, I mean, you had to buy things like phone systems, right? I remember buying a, yeah. literally buying a phone system, which I'm sure TV is completely ridiculous, right? But yeah. I mean, this is like $30,000, right? And, you know, so you and, could take and, an order. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. And, and all of that stuff has just gone to, yeah. right, has, has gone to nothing. I mean, now you're, <clears throat> now I'm running a business off the laptop, what? the laptop I'm sitting here. Yeah, I got, to. I got my first investor from how cool he thought it was that I put together all these little SaaS softwares, you know, together to run my business at really low cost. He's like, it's so freaking cool what you did with all this. And you just piece it together and you, you're running, you know, out of your garage, basically. And no one can tell. There's no way that right. anyone knew. And he was like this. He was so psyched about that. That was my angel money that came in. And well, also you know. like this stuff too, also it, it, a huge thing that isn't talked about enough. And I've tweeted about this too, is like cash flow versus, versus profit, but like more right, for yeah. th these tools, what they allow you to do is they give you the cash flow to use the cash from the business and sales to fund That's your right. business. And it's like, yeah, so exactly. VC can be more of like a, an amplifier of that rather than like the, Hey, we're going to go. And some businesses are a little bit different, but speaking for most people here, it's like, you don't need five years of like burn money before you make a sale. It's like, you need, we need to hire 15 people so we can scale this, but like we expect yeah. to be making money. And so the burn rate can be a lot less if you free up cash by like exactly. using Grasshopper as a phone system instead of yeah, like $20,000 exactly. phones. So the, right. the advantage for investors too, right? It's like, it allows you to make more bets 
but yep. also say like, hey, we know that I'm not buying a phone system. Like I'm buying talent. I'm buying, and it's like, yep. I'm right. okay. if I believe the in most talent, important I lose, yeah. that's okay, right? It's like, yeah. I mean, you don't want to lose ever, but you're at least you're putting money into the right things. Like previously it was like putting money into stuff that didn't really move the needle towards sale. It did because you needed phones, but not in the way that like up salesman can. You know, it was yeah. right. It was it was infrastructure, right? It was just yeah. it was it was plumbing and wiring, right? As opposed yeah. to stuff that was actually going to sell your product, which which actually leads me to kind of a, a topic that you and I have gone back and forth with quite a bit, um, and something I know we're both really passionate about. And you you mentioned this a little bit earlier. There's never been a better time to be alive. There's never been a better time to start a business, and that's really the the this sort of concept of the future of work, right? And you look at you know, you look at the, the the barrier to entry to start something dropping so dramatically. And, and a large part of that is the ability to participate in this economy, uh, in this sort of, you know, future of work type economy. Um, when you're looking at, you know, the, the ability to go get global, you know, get the best talent you can get globally, right? You're not restricted to your geographic region. Yeah, You can go get freelancers as a core part of your team. You don't have to go out and hire those first five people. Go out and bring the five best or two best or whatever freelancers you can possibly bring as part of your core team without treating them as sort of this us versus them. And, you know, remote work, all of these things, you know, are really driving that, you know, all of these things are really driving the future of work. What you know, what, what does that mean, do you think, today to a founder, Barrett? If you're, you know, as, as somebody who's kind of started in the past few years and continues to start businesses, you know, what, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to a founder coming out today? I think if, if you take the time to understand the ecosystem and how it works, and I think a lot of people would be surprised at some of the entrepreneurs they look up to and like how they're actually building their businesses. And I, it's good that people are being more open about this, but I think there's like some incredible companies that are using freelancers and outsourced work. And I, the funny thing is, is, is a lot of people say that this is a function of the startups, but this is actually right. the big corporate companies who invent totally. This. Yep. It, and it, it's, we've just kind of said like, Hey, we can give people more exciting opportunity. Like finance come this blows my mind is and I, I won't name them because I think they're all doing this but big global finance companies that control your social security number that control mm -hmm. your retirement <clears throat> account they're outsourcing that information overseas to call centers and they've been doing that for years and they've right. been doing that before the technology was even where it is today which makes it like more I guess more common um right. yep. and so I think what entrepreneurs have done is they've said like hey these big companies are saving cost on this, which they have been doing. They just haven't been super public about it. And people have created platforms like Upwork and like, Hey, let's let these people be entrepreneurs in their own, right? Let's let them make more money. And the best part about the freelance economy and remote work is it allows everybody in the stack to make more money. And this yep. is like where, you know, uh, we might get attacked for saying this, but this is, this is the hard truth that the people who attack this concept don't mm -hmm. like is Everyone benefits along the chain. The person who's fulfilling the work benefits because they can service more people, therefore make more money. If they have more expertise, they can charge more money. But that's still fractional compared to what hiring a full-time employee in the U.S. with benefits. So you hire someone, it costs you 30, 40% more than their salary to employ them. Right. At a minute, yeah. Um, yeah. depending on what field you're in. So when you look down the same, so the entrepreneur makes more money. The software companies that power these concepts make money. The freelancer makes money and everyone's profitable along the chain. And I think that's what's intimidating to people who don't support this is, is like, hey, this is really changing things, but it's creating entrepreneurial opportunity for everyone. And that's what I like about it. And what that does, it just allows your quality of life to be better um, for right. everyone in that chain. And that's a good thing. Can um, you, on a global, can you on go a on my website and explain too. that? Because like, <laughs> I'm in the stack and like, that is how I make my living. I'm so happy that you said that. Yeah. yeah. It's, like literally. It's true like, though. It know? is. Yeah, it we, is. It we is. just scale in and support, you know, and we have expertise and we do it for 25 software companies. So we learn faster. We know more about how this works. We get to play in a bigger field and then that benefit comes to our customers. So anyhow, sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> no, it's you got it's, all it's, excited. 
But it's so true, you know, I think it, and it's, and it's easy to, you know, Baron, I know you and I have seen comments, all kinds of comments come back to both of us on this, you know, over, over time on Twitter when we write about these things and, um, and look, and and there is, there is validity to it, right? There, there are not, not every country on earth has, is, you know, has the freedom that we do here. A lot of other countries do, right? And, you know, there are countries where this is super restricted and you are literally taking your life in your hands by being freelance entrepreneur, that kind of thing. I mean, so that 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 is real, but but unfortunately, I guess fortunately, it is it is limited, and most people in the world today have the ability to participate in this kind of freelance economy on some level, right? And it yeah. is, and simply because you know the labor rates may vary or things like that between between areas, it is it is materially you are in a materially better position, um, whether you're you know. In the Philippines, working at call center, or you're in Vietnam, working on a software engineering team, or the Ukraine, where I've, you know, where I've had teams for for years, you know, yeah. Romania, it's you know, you are in a a just so much. It's a life changing thing for so many people on a global scale, right? And as we continue to develop that, those rates, it, it, the the market takes over. Those rates continue to move up, and you've seen it all over the world happen yeah. like that. Yeah, the, the and so I think that the. But here's the the interesting thing about this is like I look at this through a pro America lens, right? So mm-hmm. everything else is going digital in our world, like friendships, right? It's like we've never met in person, but like we've become good friends, and like I think this is just the beginning of this type of stuff. Like I think there'll be all like Absolutely. virtual experiences you can do together, and there's going to be a lot built out around this. But so you, you you take that concept, and then you take the concept of saying like, hey, look at all the incredible successful people that have immigrated to the United States and built monstrous literally some of the yeah. probably the best entrepreneurs in our country are are people who came here um, absolutely from another country who were born yeah. in another country. Yeah. i think all this is doing is just like digitizing the american economy which is the best economy in the history of the world in terms of innovation and making things happen so to me like it's making the world a better place because we're bringing the mindset that made america america to other places like whether it's South America or the Philippines and like what will happen is those people will become entrepreneurs. They'll have more money. They'll invest in their local communities and like, it'll make everything better. Once you know, like you don't have to go somewhere to experience like the, the culture and benefit from the yeah, economy. Yeah. And like, this, that's what I like the point that's hard to articulate on Twitter or something. But when someone bashes this, I'm like, this is literally the best thing maybe to happen in human history because mm-hmm. we're taking this, isolated concept which is america on the other side of the world like our geographical advantage of where we are has been huge in the growth of america and we're basically yeah, yeah. giving it back to the world in the form of entrepreneurship and I, I, like the relate i've worked with the same teams for like three or four years like these are my friends these are like the same right, as right. i worked with people in the office and people don't view it that way and it's the people who haven't done it they haven't employed right, the people. Right. Yeah. They don't know them. It's just like being with your neighbor at work. It's they're your friends, you know, their birthday, you know, their kids. It's the same thing. Yeah. Um, I, I started, I started my most recent company. I started Outmatch, which I, you know, just wound down as the CEO fairly recently and now, now called Harbor. I started that business with a team that was originally in Ukraine and now in Romania. I mean, these people, they, most of these people never worked for me directly, became some of my closest friends still are today in in many cases, and were as instrumental to that company and building that company today. They are my co-founders. They are the people who helped build this. Um, you know, I would see them, and I, I actually did. You know, a couple, few times a year, I would go try to spend time with them. Is it because you, you know, you do want that human connection? But yep. it didn't matter whose paycheck yeah. they came from. They were, we were one team. These were my friends. You know, the, these were people who I would, you know, if I went over to Bucharest today, there's no question that I'd be spending time with them or, you know, and, and it, it's tragic, you know, in but Kharkiv, I think, um, you know, what's, you know, that yeah. our, our team originally was in Kharkiv, Ukraine. And um, fortunately, you know, not all of them are still there anymore. And, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, what it can, you, the power that it can really bring if you you're can, not scared of it. You can really build, like I built these relationships over the last, you know, five years with people in other countries I've never seen before. And they're really good friends. Like yeah. if I called yeah. them and said, Hey, can you help me out? They, they'd probably say, Oh yeah. What, what do you need me to do? 
And I've gotten a couple of those phone calls and it's, it's really cool when they do it. Cause I'm like, this is my friend from the UK that I've never physically seen. That was like, and I can't wait for the time I'm going to sh- share a pint with them, but you know, like they're just, it's just so cool. What kind of relationship you can actually generate um, in this environment. It's, it really is incredible. So yeah. we're going to, we're running up against it on time here, but I've got to get a couple of questions in that came in from Twitter. Um, I sent out a, a post uh, early last week. I said, you're going to be on the podcast and got, uh, got a bunch of questions come in. So I want to just take a, take our last couple minutes here and ask you a couple of them. Uh, Josh Bonhodel, who we both uh, know well, Josh, great person to follow on Twitter for, uh, for coaching advice and things like that. Um, uh, it, oh, so I should say, before I go into this, Barrett, you're a college athlete. Um, you know, yep. a, a pretty yep. accomplished college athlete, baseball player. Um, so, you know, you might want to explain the, I had to ask you about this in our, in our, you know, in the, in the pre-interview here, but um, Josh asked if NIL existed while you were playing baseball, how would you position yourself to extract the most value from it? So first start define just for anybody who's not familiar what NIL is and then. Um, yeah. So NIL is the the new rule that is in place, which basically allows college athletes to benefit financially from their name image or likeness so um not being paid like directly by the ncaa or their school for playing the sport but it could range from like being sponsored by nike if you're yep. an elite athlete all the way to like i don't know like the the donut shop in your local college. A car dealership at yeah, your it, local college it, yeah it could be Booster anything Club. And so like my college experience was unique. I originally played baseball at university of Virginia, which was a top program, I suffered an injury. And then I ended up transferring because I couldn't really play at that level anymore. So um, the way that I think about this, I'll think about it through like the lens of at, at UVA where it's, you know, many of my teammates played in the major leagues. Um, and so I think there's some people that would have legitimately benefited from it. So I've always thought that this is something that, I mean, how can an organization say that you can't benefit financially from your name, image, or likeness? I mean, it's literally yeah. your own identity. So right. it, it's like, if you think about how, like what that means at a human level, it's like, if I want to pay you for being Peter or you for being Greg and someone's going to step in and tell me no, I mean, come on. Right. That's a little crazy. So Just because they gave you a scholarship. It's, yeah. It and I do sense. think the, the NCAA and like, I, so you put in about 40, 50, maybe 60 hours a week as a division one athlete, a top program. Yep. You do um, one way or the other. And on top of school, it's difficult, but I actually don't think that there is a legitimate way for like the schools to pay the athletes. Like as much as I do think they probably deserve yep. it, like I, the, the money has to come from somewhere. I don't think it's there. So therefore that leaves name image likeness as the, the kind of the obvious opportunity. And then yep. here's the example I always use for people. If you're an artist, you can get a full scholarship to the University of Virginia for being a fantastic artist. You can go into class, you could paint a picture, get an A plus on the picture, hang it on the wall at the local coffee shop and sell it for $10,000. And -hmm. there's no issue with that. Why? How is that allowed? But I can't put on a pitching lesson clinic using my name in my hometown and make $10,000 for it. Right. What is the difference? It's, It's monetizing a skill that you've put time, energy, and effort into over time, and I understand if a lot a school says, "Hey, you can't. Hey, you're an athlete at the University of Oregon. You can't say University of Oregon football player camp." I get that, right? Like that would be the same right. as saying, like, yeah. you work at Nike, and like, you know, we're like right. using Nike as an advertiser. Like, there's like trademarks and stuff like that. I get that, but if people in your hometown know you, or people wanna wanna have you on their car dealership or come and sign baseballs or footballs for the day. I mean, I think it's absolutely egregious. And I think there's a lot of athletes that probably missed out on life-changing money early in their life because of that. And I think, and then they get hurt about, yeah. And I think lastly, one of the best parts about college athletics is it raises people from non-ideal situations, giving an opportunity for a fantastic education and a life-changing opportunity because of athletics and to pull the financial part, which at the end of the day, you need money to live is maybe the most, one of the most important pieces of that. I think there's a lot of people in the past who got robbed, frankly. Um, yeah. I really do. And, but I think it's a good thing now. And it's like looking forward. I think there's a ton of ways for these college athletes to use their name to make money. And as far as me, I'm not sure that I had the juice to pull, <laughs> to pull uh, anything yeah. serious out of it, but who knows, maybe I could have got a couple bucks. That's um, right. That's yeah, right. Totally. So, 
so the, the last question here, and then we got to wrap it up is from Alex Banks. Um, and I think this is the perfect question to kind of end the uh, end the pod this uh, this week on. Uh, when you think of success, who's the first person that comes to your mind and why? Yeah, I definitely think of my dad. And um, it's because he found a way without the education, like the time and money thing that we were talking about, he found a way to like to do both um, kind of on his own, which I thought was cool. Like we're so lucky to have Twitter and like I go to the right colleges to kind of learn this stuff and and at least be exposed to the ideas. But it's like he built a business and and rather than spend profits on himself throughout the years, he just invested into real estate like consistently for 30 years. And it's like he was at all of our baseball games. He was there. So he got to like build some wealth, but also be there really all the time. And so I, I think that like, I, that is, is really what I think it comes down to is like your entire family loves you and you have a little bit of money. I mean, it's like, that's, that's kind of what we're all shooting for, I think. So I think that it's been good to have him as a role model for that. Yeah. No, I think, uh, I think that's a perfect way to end Barrett. Absolutely. Um, wait, before we do, you got a project. I, 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 can't, we can't run out of time before you got to plug your your uh, your new project here because it's uh, it's it's so cool and how can people check it out? Yeah, for sure. So um, check out bravo.io. That's b r a v a u x dot i o, and it's a project that um, Sawhill Bloom and I are working on. And and basically what we're doing is we're empowering small businesses and startups to reward employees, clients, and prospects. Um, in real time, send virtual gift cards in one click, um, do market research, say thanks, catch a prospect's eye. That's really the, the goal. It's super easy to use and um, really rooted in psychology with reciprocity and building strong relationships. So um, there's a lot there. There's going to be a lot more coming on that soon. And I appreciate the uh, opportunity for the plug. I'll put it in the uh, I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, Bravo again. It's like if you're in New Orleans, again, you want to spell Bravo, B B R A V. Spell it again, V R A V R A V A U X. It's uh yeah, the French play on Bravo, like good job. Um love it. And, uh so yeah, we're um we're excited about that. We think it's gonna make a make a big difference for a lot of small businesses and retaining talent and closing some deals. And if people cool. want to connect with you, follow you, Barrett J. O'Neill. Yeah, follow me on on Twitter. Uh, my DMs are are always open. There's always interesting stuff coming through there. <laughs> so, um it's uh yeah, feel free to shoot me a DM. We'll connect there. Yep, and Barrett's cool. uh, Barrett's handle will be in the show notes. Also, it's uh, Barrett J O'Neill on uh, on Twitter. So Barrett, uh, tons of fun having you. We knew uh, we knew this was going to be an awesome one, and it didn't uh, it didn't disappoint. So thanks uh, thanks so much for joining us on the Founders Journey. Uh, we will see you next time on uh, on our next episode. Awesome, thanks for having me, guys.